Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn and this is my YouTube channel for everything I want to talk about science and math. Today we're in chemistry class talking about the gas laws because they're good to know. All right, so if y'all will follow along with your notes, we will, uh, I lost my pen, there it is. Uh, we'll be filling them out. So let me go over a little bit again my philosophy of teaching. Okay, when I started teaching decades ago, we don't talk about how many, um, I taught chemistry and math like a regular teacher where you would teach a little bit of the like there was a chapter or a unit and i'd teach a little bit every day and then we would practice the math on that or maybe we'd do a lab or something and then the next day we would learn a little bit more it's how you learn in math class in math class you take a, a new section every day and you build on it right every day you learn something new in math and then every day you get to practice that thing that you learned okay and my failure rate was like regular teachers about 20 percent about 20 percent of the kids failed uh my my classes and then i saw i listened to a, a i was listening to npr y'all ever listen to npr and there was a show all things considered i think it's still on there and i was teaching in a much more urban school and um, it was much closer to Atlanta. And the students had different challenges than you guys have. We had more poverty, we had more gangs, we had more drugs. It was just a little bit, you know, urban flavored, a little more city. So um, when I, this show on NPR was about, um, it was three teachers who would teach in the very worst part of the United States. One was in Chicago, one was in New York City, and I can't remember the third one. But like one of the teachers, when they would go to school, they had to be parked underneath the school. They would have an armed escort up to their classroom and their desk was behind bulletproof glass. So the t kids would slide their papers under a bulletproof glass. So the kids were on one side and the teacher on the other. Okay, that is not the kind of school I taught in. But these teachers, and found a way to have success even in that situation. So I thought, oh, I'll listen to this. And um, I got some ideas from them. I kind of put their best ideas together into one. And I came up with this idea that I do, which is that instead of Tate learning a little bit at a time, we learn all at once the whole unit. We go over the whole unit in one day of notes. And how I can go so fast is the guided notes. And then some of you, it will be too fast for, especially the math. But then we'll spend the next two weeks going over those same concepts again and again in different ways. We'll do a lab with it. We'll see a video on it. We'll do an activity. We'll, um, we're, we're get, we'll do lots of worksheets. We'll go over the worksheets. I usually give you the answers to the worksheets. And then by the end, most people do really good. And so like last year, I had no kids fail. I have all the kids. And the year before that, I had no kids fail. I usually have nobody fail. It's a great method and I, I kind of stole it from those three urban teachers but and it went, made my failure rate even at that urban school go down to almost nothing to the point that the administration was going what are you doing? Well you know how did your kids all start passing? And not everybody makes an A. Chemistry is hard. You know the math classes I teach are hard and, um, and physics is hard but if, if you show up and, and pay attention and do your work, you're gonna pass. And it's not because I've made it easier. In fact, I use a lot of the same exact test questions I used when I had the 20% failure rate. If it was a good question then, it's still a good question. It's just that the method changed and it's a better method because it has more repetition. You, I end up repeating a lot, don't I? And in the end, you start by the, by the test, you kind of know it. So I think that I forgot to explain that enough to you because some of y'all were getting frustrated with the speed of this class. But I promise you, if you just sort of trust the method, you might not get an A unless you work hard and come to tutoring and stuff like that. But, um, but you should pass. And that's pretty good. This is considered a rigor class and there's an honors class. You know, the, it, it, it's a good method. It works, yes. I should write a book, Get Rich. What was the other class that you used for, like, cell the, You have to have four rigor classes. I think the second year of language counts for it. So if you're taking a foreign language, that. Algebra two counts. 
any math algebra two and up counts. Um, so that calculus, pre-calculus. Um, uh, chemistry counts, physics counts, forensics counts. So my kids took forensics as their extra one because they wanted to take a foreign language, my children, they wanted to take a foreign language that wasn't part of their school. So um, they wanted Japanese and their school didn't offer Japanese. So they took two years of Japanese. And then because it wasn't with a Japanese teacher, they did independent study. Uh, we weren't sure if it would count, so they went and picked up the forensics. You just have to have the GPA and a high enough ACT or SAT score. I don't remember, but you can go on uh, the, it's on the online, or you could ask the counselors. They know it too. Yeah. No, it's not like, it's not 4 -0. It's like maybe a, maybe a 3.75, maybe a 3.5, something like that. Okay, so let's talk about the gas laws. So we're going to do the notes fast. Don't get frustrated. We're going to be looking at some math fast, but you can do it. Okay, so gases. So right now, you don't realize it. You feel like everything's just light as air in here, but the atmosphere is pressing in on you. Right now, we are living in a sea of air, and it's pressing in on you. You grew up your whole life under it, so you don't even feel it. But if you hadn't, you'd notice it. So gases exert pressure. on their surroundings. You're familiar with atmospheric pressure, which is the gases all pushing on you, and the symbol for pressure is P. So it did all right, it won. That's why your ears pop when you go up, right? That's why your ears pop when you go up or down. If you, if you go down like oh, yeah, you scuba diving in the pool, you feel that pressure when you dive down, yes. Is this like, if you went to space, Uh, if you went to space without a space suit, then you, the, the pressure would be gone on you, but you would be pushing out. You'd pop like a piece of popcorn. No, like the pressure came back to Earth. It would, it would be like you coming, you know, like when you're in the mountains uh -huh. and you come back down. Uh -huh. So uh, how your ears pop and it feel, you know, once you get back down after your ears pop, you feel normal again. Okay, so you live in a sea of air, but you're used to it. So all around us is air. The, um, the atmosphere only goes a little bit up though. Like if you, um, if, if the earth was an apple, the atmosphere would just be the apple skin. So the air on our earth isn't as thick as you think it is. It's just right there held on by gravity. And okay, so pressure, one of the gases are one of the first things that early chemists, when chemistry very first started, it was one of the first things they started working with and discovering. So because so many people were working with it all over, you know, the Europe and stuff, I wouldn't say the whole world, but at least Europe, um, that, that um, there's a whole lot of different units. And one of the things you have to do with gas law problems is make sure you're using the same units. You can't compare, have two different units and it make any sense. So one of the things, so we're going to have a whole list of them, but the first one is pounds. We're used to English is what we have mostly. So if, if the amount of pressure on one square inch is 14.7 pounds. So I want everybody to look at one little square inch on your palm. And imagine how heavy 14 pounds is. That's how much the air is pushing on just one little square inch of you. So you're under tremendous pressure, you just don't realize it. If you think about your stomach, a square foot, it's over 2,000 pounds. It's 2,116 pounds per square foot. So right now, on just your stomach, not your whole body, there's 2,000 pounds of pressure, but you're used to it. So, um, so like if we took you into outer space where you're pushing out and it's not pushing back, you would pop. We see this with fish that are in deep ocean. They're, they've grown up their whole life under tremendous deep ocean pressure. And when fishermen catch them and bring them up to just one atmosphere to sea level, they kind of die. And their, um, their, their guts will come out their mouth, out their anus, out their eyes. They just, you can look it up on uh, 
You can look it up on the internet. There's pictures of exploded fish. Uh huh. Shh. Did you hear that? No bulge. So even grouper, grouper will do it. They're a deep fish. And those aren't even the ones that are way down with the little lights like in uh, Finding Nemo. You know, those really deep fish. All right, so in science, these are some of the things you need to know. One of the units we use is MMHG, that's millimeters of mercury, and one atmosphere, the amount of pressure on you right now, is 760 millimeters of mercury. This is a barometer. This is a picture one. And so this is mercury in there. And when the atmosphere pushes on this mercury, pushes down on it, it shoves it up the little column. And how far the atmosphere can shove it up, just regular, is 760 millimeters. Um, so, but actually it rises and falls a little bit depending on the weather. It also rises and falls depending on if you're at sea level. There's more pressure at sea level than up in the mountains. It'd have less pressure on it. Also with the weather, um, you can remember this little rhyme, the highs, they bring clear skies. So if the mercury starts dropping, that's a low pressure, it's going to storm. If it's a high pressure, and then it's clear. The highs, they bring clear skies. Okay, so another one of unit is TOR, and TOR and millimeters of mercury is the same thing. So sometimes you see it as millimeters of mercury. Usually you do. Sometimes you see it as TOR. Um, also, on the weather, they'll give inches of mercury also, but we're not going to do inches because we're in science class. Another one is kilopascals, and this is the one we use a lot in science, and it's 101.3 kilopascals. It, another one I want you to fill in is bar. Bar. And it's the same as this one, but you switch the decimal point. It's 1.013 bar. Um, more decimals, same number. Just like those are the same number. So these numbers you don't have to memorize. They're on the back of that laminated periodic table, and the formulas for this unit are on that too. But if you're not, but I would write it on my cheat sheet periodic table. Yes. What is bar? Bar is just a unit of pressure. Just like atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, inches of mercury, they're all just, like I said, because this was one of the first areas that early chemists studied. And in fact, the guy who's considered the father of chemistry, Antoine Lavoisier, I'm sure I nailed that in perfect French. Um, he, what he worked with a lot was oxygen, oxygen gas. He discovered oxygen gas. He didn't know it was all in there, but he discovered it. Okay, so these early, early scientists all worked a lot with gas. Gas is one of the first things. Heat and gas, and that's what this test is on, heat and gas. Okay, so sometimes you have to convert between pressure units. So here's an example. The pressure of a tire is 28 PSI, pounds per square inch. Anybody familiar with that one? If you've got a car and you've checked the pressure, you know about PSI, pounds per square inch. What is that in atmosphere, in tor, in kilopascals? So whenever you do a unit conversion, first you write what you no. know. So our, what we know is 28 PSI. And, uh, and then we can convert it, and we see that one square inch is 14.7 PSI. And that's equal to the pressure that one atmosphere puts on you. It's the same thing. So it would be 1.9 atmospheres. Simple unit conversion. Does that one make sense to you? Where did, how did I get the 14.7 um, the or the 1.9? You do 28 divided by 14.7. Because that's our given. That's what we know. Okay, so if we were going to change it to TOR, then we would put 20, uh, let's change colors. We'll put 28 PSI, and the denominator goes 14.7 PSI, 
And that's the same thing as 760 Tor. So that would be ah, 1447.6 Tor. So there's our tire for in PSI. And if we were going to convert it to kilopascals, we'll change to orange. I like orange. Then you do 28. Whoops, it didn't change. 28 PSI. And this 14.7 PSI. And this time is 101.3. I always think that sounds like a radio station. Atmospheres. I think it is. 101.3. <laughs> we'll have to listen to it. it. Has to be one somewhere. It's got to be one somewhere. 192. Point, in physics, we talk about where those numbers come from, the radio stations. All right. So those are just simple unit conversions. Yes, sir. Tor 760 Tor is one atmosphere. 760 Tor. So the answer is 1447.6 Tor. Where does the radio station name come from? They come from the, the bandwidth of the wave of the electromagnetic spectrum for, uh, for the radio waves, which, are, which travel at the set speed of light. They're a kind of light. Because you you, it gets converted to sound, but it's light, a kind of light, yes. Y'all be quiet, and you talk loud. What's the 14.7? That's the amount one atmosphere pushes on you in pounds per square inch, PSI. 14.7. Remember, we looked at our palm and we saw one inch. Okay. We feel pretty good about all this. Okay, the next part's really easy. You, sh you learned it in elementary school. Phases of matter. We're just reviewing them. Since we're talking about gases, we're going to review a little bit about... Um, the phases of matter. Okay, I'm gonna wait till people stop looking so that so I know they're through writing, and I'll scroll. You know it's bad when it's nine thirty and you're already like, I'm hungry. My breakfast didn't last. It's a long time till lunch, and I have to cover somebody's class. I don't get a planning period. <laughs> we have our lunch. I'll just take my feet. Last time I had to cover someone's class, I made them come in here because I needed to put away chemicals. I, and there weren't many of them. It was Miss Foster's kids. I just made them come to my room. This, this is somebody in the, the biology part, though. I don't know if I'm bringing all of her kids. Okay, can I scroll? Y'all look like you're through writing. Uh, let's see if they'll let me. Sometimes if you click a bunch, they don't let you scroll. Look at that. All right, I want to go back. Okay, the phases of matter. Okay, so let's see if you already know it. Which one is in a crystal lattice? It has a definite shape and volume. It has lower heat and energy, and the molecules can only vibrate. Solid. Y'all are ready for this. So that's the solid right there. This one, the molecules are free to move. They take the shape of their container, but they have a definite volume. Which one's that one? Liquid. Okay, and now the next one, so, the, so that's that one. The molecules are free to move faster. They take the shape and fill their container. They have high energy or heat. Gas. Gas, and that's the one we're talking about. And then, this one is high energy, they move very fast, and they're in fluorescent lights and in stars. Plasma, Plasma. very good. They're talking about there's a new state of matter, I was reading the physics on it, at, at extreme cold. Yeah, at absolute zero, something about some metals, It's some new research. I, they didn't quite convince me it was a new state of the matter. I'm a skeptic. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about is the relationship between vapor pressure and boiling, first of all. 
the re relationship between vapor pressure and boiling. I want you to understand how boiling happens. Oh, I forgot to get that. I had a demo for you here. Uh, I might give you all the notes because I need to sort of stay in front of the camera and then I'll show you the demos and, and you can put notes of where they need to go. If my mouth starts bleeding again, tell me. I keep having to have dental work and they keep busting my lips and then they bleed. And uh, I'm paying them thousands of dollars just to do this to me. And they always say, you have such a small mouth. And I'm like thinking, really? I don't think so. I think you're just rough, busting my lips. Okay, so well, the relationship between vapor pressure and boiling. Okay, so what happens with this is, when you have a pan and it's starting to boil, it gets bubbles on the bottom first. Have you ever noticed that? And at first it doesn't bubble, it doesn't boil. They just sit on the bottom. What's happening is, is it's trying to go through phase change and change from water to water vapor. Remember how we learned this phase diagram in our last unit? So it, this is how I told you these go together. One atmosphere is at 100 degrees and one atmosphere is where it switches from liquid water to water vapor. Does that make sense on the, on the little diagram here? So if you have a temperature less than 100 at one atmosphere, it tries to boil, but it's in this water part and it can't boil yet. And when the bubbles form, the atmosphere on the top of the water squish them back so the bubbles are not free to come up to the top. They're trying to form, but the atmosphere pushing on the top of the pot of water is squishing them and they can't boil. Finally, when it gets up to 100, then, the, then it is going to be where the atmosphere can't push them down anymore because it's made it to this line where boiling happens. This line is boiling. Now, uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to show you. Uh, yeah, I've got one demonstration for you right here. We're going to do it in a minute though. I'm going to teach it all and then we'll do the demonstrations. Okay, so then the next thing. Um, so we're going to do a demonstration about how boiling can happen at a lower temperature. If it is under less pressure, boiling can happen at a lower temperature. Okay, and so I've got a little thing to demonstrate that for you. Okay, let's scroll on up. Let's see if it'll let me do it here. Nope. We'll do it over here. To the gas laws. <laughs> Okay, so there's a song. Of course there is. Okay, this is the song. The gas laws are good to know. You should dance too. You can use them everywhere you go. We're talking PV equals NRT. We're talking heavy duty chemistry. There's some verses too, but y'all don't know enough to learn them. So we'll continue to sing the song throughout this unit. I know I'll be remember PV equals NRT. All right. Important for guests. Oh, we're did, my singing is bothering Miss Corn's class. She had to shut the door. <laughs> Important for gas law problems, temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So this is the first step. If it gives you the temperature in anything but Kelvin, you have to change it. And how you do that is it's the Celsius degrees plus 273. That's also on that periodic table of mine. But if you're going to use yours, be sure to write that formula on there. To get Kelvin, is Celsius plus 273. <laughs> all right, so here are our gas laws. The first one is Charles. They're all named after the person who de developed them. And um, this is the, what happens. If you have a gas, so everybody imagine you've got a gas in a closed container, and you heat it up, what happens to the volume of that gas? Does it want to go up or down or stay the same? What's going to happen to its volume? Say I've got a, a mylar balloon, and it's a little low, and I heat it up. Is the balloon going to stay the same, fluff out, or shrink? Fluff out. So if the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. If the temperature goes down, the volume goes 
down. If you if you put a balloon in the freezer, it'll get smaller. You might have noticed this, especially if you have a winter birthday. You have your mylar balloon you got for your birthday. You tie it on your chair because you're the birthday boy or girl. You go to bed, it's flying high. You get up in the morning, it's cool in the kitchen, or and the balloon will be all sunk down. Yes. It's, that has to do with the page we just had. A uh, liquid, when it freezes, goes into a crystal lattice. Because water is shaped like Mickey Mouse and has that positive and negative end, it, when it freezes, it, it's not close in the crystal lattice. It spreads out where the positive and negatives line up where they are touching each other. That causes the water to spread out into little circles of six. It's why snowflakes have six points. And when it spreads out, it makes a little hole of air in the middle. So it increases in volume. It's why ice floats and why a coke will explode. It's because it, it, that it's going to increase in volume as it freezes. And it's strong enough to bust the coke bottle. Yes? Uh, I, I first noticed that with like tires. Like we, for Thanksgiving, we first, like, started out on a trip, like, in the afternoon when it was, like, really cold. Uh -huh. And with our, I think our tires were, like, they looked, like, real low, like, maybe 25 mm -hmm. tires. Get flatter, like, yeah. Yes. But then, but when we got to where we were going, which was, like, six hours away, and we did, like, six hours of driving, they were, like, really big. Right. So it heated it up. And people, especially when they go from up north, like people driving from Canada to Florida for vacation, they know that they have to release tire pressure on the way. Because if their tire pressures were inflated for Canadian winter, they can't just drive to Florida and it be, you know, 85 degrees in the winter. It will it'll bust their tires. So that's interesting, isn't it? Something I never thought of living in the South. Georgia, Florida, not that far away. Never had to th think about my tire pressure going to Florida. It's, it's close enough. All right, so if the temperature goes down, the volume goes down. Now, our formula is this. It's volume one over temperature one equals volume two over temperature two. I drew it as a slash uh, uh, fraction bar, you don't do that. I had to do that because word is not made for science. It won't let you do fractions on top of each other nicely. There's a program that you can buy that costs a lot of money where it will make it where you can type science, but I don't have that program. But my son has a, he, he teaches at Georgia Tech, and of course they have the science program where you can type in science. And I'm like, isn't, the, isn't it allowed for you to copy it to your mom's computer if she teaches science at a public school? Like, you know, we're all on the same team. Can I have the program too? And he was like, no, mom, I'm not getting fired over you get, trying to get my science program. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, so uh, when you do this, I want your fraction bars flat because what I've seen is students will start with a fraction like um, uh, two two-thirds, but because they write messy and fast, before you know it, that's um, 213. So Charles's law shows what happens with hot air balloons. You heat up a hot air balloon. There's air in hot air balloons. Not There's not helium in them or anything like that. You heat up the air and it increases the volume. Does that make sense? You heat up the air, increases the volume. Okay, the next one is boils. Okay, if you increase the pressure on some gas, if I had one of these balloons and I could squish it really hard, would the volume go up or down? Uh, it'd go down. It'd go down. If I'm strong enough and I can squish it, it would go down. I'm pretty sure you're strong enough to squish it. Probably so. Okay, and but if the pressure went down, if I put that, that balloon in a vacuum, would it get bigger or smaller? Uh, no, if the pressure was down, the volume would go up. And we're going to do some, some demonstrations with this. Okay, so pressure down, it's less pressure. You put it in a vacuum, it'll grow. The balloon would get bigger. So Dalton's law is pressures add up. So you can imagine this. 
If you had Coca-Cola and you were at the Coca-Cola bottling co company and you are putting that Coca-Cola under pressure and you put a squirt of air to put it under pressure, but you want it to have some carbonation. So you, which is, air is nitrogen, oxygen, but you wanted to add some carbon dioxide. So you squirted some more gas in there, carbon dioxide. All three of those gases pressure would then be added up in that Coca-Cola. Does that make sense to you? So pressures add up. Um, so the greater the density, the greater the pressure. More gases, greater pressure. So the total pressure is however many gases you have added up. Dalton's law of par partial pressures. Okay, the next one, I'm gonna say it Guy Lussac because that's how I heard it. It's spelt Gay Lussac. Don't know, don't know French, thinking he's French. Don't know how to say it, but I think it's Guy, Guy Lussac, so spelt gay. Um, pressure and temperature. This is his thing. That if the temperature goes up, what happens to the pressure? If I had a can of Coke and I heated it up enough, what would happen to that can of Coke? Sure if I heat it up? If, okay, let's think about this. Imagine I'm at Lake Lanier and I have a bunch of buddies and we have a keg of beer. And we drink all the, ke the beer out of it. So now there's just air in the keg of beer and we're drunk. And we think it'd be fun to throw the keg on the fire. What's eventually going to happen to that keg on the fire? It's going to blow up. And it did and it killed some people. This was a true story. Georgians, Georgia rednecks killing themselves. Okay, so uh, it will blow up. It's because as you heat it up, what happened to the pressure? Did it go up, down, or stay the same? It went up. And we have some dead people at Lake Lanier as a result. So temperature up, pressure up. Temperature down, pressure down. Did they ever find both of the bodies that were lost there? Or is there still oh, there's there? tons of bodies that have gotten lost there all the time. Which there's this whole thing about, there's some video that I was watching about that there is a certain dead body to water ratio that eventually where it's okay to swim. Like we know there's dead bodies in Lake Lanier, but we swim there anyway. It's fine. But if there was a dead body in the swimming pool, you wouldn't swim there, right? So there's a certain water to, to a dead body ratio when it gets to be okay. Ocean, there's dead bodies in there. We, we're fine. We swim in there, right? So it's the dead body to water ratio. Okay, now, so here it is. This is the drawing. There's the keg of beer going into the fire. It blew up. Don't ever throw cans in the fire. They can blow up and kill you. Okay, now the ideal gas law, that's the one I sang. Uh, PV equals NRT. Um, the factors are all, are, the factors all interact. They're all connected. I think I'm going to say connected. I'm going to erase that. The, the factors, let's say they all connect. All connected. So, this is the whole little formula. PV equals NRT. P is pressure. V is volume. N is number of moles. R is a constant. 8.3140 uh, uh, liters, kilopascals per mole Kelvin. The constant is different depending on what unit you have for your pressure. So this is the one if your pressure is in kilopascals, but there's different ones. So this will be given to you on the problem. There's different ones depending on what unit of pressure you have. Okay. Oh, right, can I scroll? Are we good with that? They're all connected. You got that written down? Let's see. The, the notes are being very good today. I've, I've done a new thing where I convert them to a P, uh, PDF. Oh, I need to give that one. We'll do it like that. Okay, so there's one more called the combined gas law. And this is where you just combine some of them. It's P1 V1 over T2, T1 equals P, P2 V2 over T2. How these problems work, you'll be given every one except one letter. You substitute them into the formula. You solve for the letter you're missing. 
you'll be given everything but one is simple algebra solve for x. And if you're not good at that, now's a good time to get better at it, right? I'll help you. Okay, now I'm going to scroll some more. Now, what makes up our sea of air? So, uh, approximately 80% of our air is nitrogen gas. 20% is oxygen. Now, 80 and 20 is 100, and you know it's not really 100% because there's other gases like carbon dioxide. <sighs> You're breathing it out right now. You know, helium, hydrogen, neon. There's other gases out there, but basically it's 80-20. So there's other gases too. What's the percentage of gases when you exhale? It's you breathe in 80-20. Uh, you breathe out 80-15-5. You only use 5%, five uh, the, of the what you breathe out, 5% carbon dioxide. You're still breathing out 15% oxygen. If you breathed out all carbon dioxide, CPR would kill them faster. Does that make sense? You'd just kill them faster if you weren't breathing out oxygen too. <laughs> right? Carbon dioxide would kill them faster. You'd smother them. Okay. Now, one of the gases is O3, ozone. Ozone is an important shield for our planet. It's made by lightning. And copiers. So if you ever gone into where a copier is and you smell it, like you go in Staples and you smell that smell, that's ozone. It's considered a pollution down here on Earth, but it's important for our ozone layer. It helps shield our planet. Now, I always want to bring this out because I, I especially used to get these kids who were terrified that we had a hole in the ozone and that the ozone was being destroyed and that we were going to destroy our planet and we're all going to die. And they were under the misconception that once ozone's gone, we'll never get it back again. It's const our planet is amazing, and it's constantly making ozone with lightning. You can see pictures from like the space shuttle and stuff. There is lightning going on all over our planet all the time. Somewhere it's raining, somewhere it's making lightning, and it's making ozone. So this being replenished. The other thing about the hole in the ozone is we don't know if it's always been there because we didn't get up to space to look until, you know, the 60s is when we first went to space. And so it was more like the 70s before we found out there was a hole. We don't know if, there, if there's always been a hole and it's natural because the hole grows and shrinks. And where it is, is where there's not a lot of people. It's not like the holes over New York City or Beijing or, you know, M Mumbai, these big places where there's a lot of pollution. That's not where it is. It's like down near Antarctica. Antarctica, where there's like nobody but some penguins anyway. So, um, so we there's still stuff for us to learn about this whole hole. Yes. So it's like it's like a little area with nothing. With no ozone. Uh huh. Yeah. And we don't know if it's natural and it's already always been there. We know it grows and shrinks depending on the weather, depending on what time of year it is. It grows and shrinks, not by pollution. So we don't. Know, there, there's a theory. That pollution, because on Earth in the lab, if you have certain chemicals with ozone, they react and it destroys it. Uh, CFCs, chlorofluorotetra, I've forgotten the whole name of it. But CFCs are one of these chemicals that on Earth, in a lab, it will destroy ozone. The problem is, is these are giant chemicals. And for them to get all the way to the ozone is highly unlikely. Does that make sense? There, it'd be like suddenly a brick t taking flight and zipping up to outer space all by itself. How is this giant molecule going to rise when it's super big and dense? How is it going to rise all the way out to outer space almost to destroy this layer? could be happening, so therefore CFCs have been banned because just in case we don't want to make a hole in it, if do you know? We don't, we don't want to later go, oh, we shouldn't have done that. It's better to be safe than sorry. Yes? We're learning about refrigerants and auto. I think 
think we learned about that, and uh, they're called uh -huh. chlorofluorocarbons, I think. Chlorofluora tetra something. Chlorofluora tetra carbons. carbons. Is that it? So, yeah. So anyway, so yes, it's been a big thing with air conditionings, yeah, air conditioners. Um, Yes, and uh, th things that like um, certain propellants, like in hairsprays, there was a big move to get rid of hairspray that sprays and go to a pump instead to get rid of some of these chemicals. Now, th this new science is they don't really think that those chemicals get to the ozone. So for a while, all you, there were lots of spray bottles, and then there weren't anything. Everything was a pump. Have you noticed the spray bottles are back? Spray is back. It's because they think that it doesn't really. We were being re safe rather than sorry. That's smart, right? But now that we know a little bit more, we think that that's not really making the hole in the ozone. And the hole might be completely natural. We don't know. You can grow up and be a gas scientist and find out for us. Okay. So there are two people who are considered the father of chemistry. Joseph Priestley and Antoine Lavoisier. Both of them are considered to have discovered oxygen. And so the first one is Joseph Priestley. And what he figured out was he took a mouse and he put it under a bell jar, which I'm gonna show you one on Wednesday, a big one. I'm gonna show you a little one today. And the mouse died. So there was something that the mouse needed. What did the mouse need? Oxygen. But so, and then he put a plant under there with a different mouse and the mouse lived. So he showed that this plant was making something that we can't see that the mouse needed. So he proved that we need oxygen, oxygen's in the air, and that you die without it. Pretty important. Does that say lightning? What? Does that say lightning up there? Uh, lightning, yes. It's made by lightning. My pen kind of cuts in and out. Lightning. Okay, so that's Joseph Priestley. The next one is Anton Lavoisier. And he figured out through chemical experiments that certain experiments give off bubbles. Bubbles are gases. And he collected those bubbles, and it was oxygen being given off. And he figured out that you could breathe it. And he and his family would breathe it regularly, not knowing that they were always breathing oxygen because they didn't know quite what it was. And he started chemistry. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about his story because it's interesting. He was a scientist in France a long time ago. Like, say, think Beauty and the Beast time, okay? And he was a commoner, but he was real smart. And he married a rich, aristocratic girl. I'm sure they loved each other, and it wasn't just for her money. But it gave him the opportunity to have a life of leisure where he could work on his science. And she was his lab assistant. So, I mean, they were in it together. It didn't seem to just be for the money. But, and she would help him in the lab, and they were happily married and uh, doing great. And he was discovering things and starting chemistry, father of chemistry. Well, then, bad thing happened. Now, I always worry about Belle and Beauty and the Beast, the French Revolution. And then the people who lived in the castles, it wasn't good for them, was it? So the revolution is happening, and Antoine Lavoisier realizes that he is in a noble family. He will probably die. And sure enough, the French Revolution was horrible. They didn't just kill people in power. They killed the whole families. They marched the husband, the wife, children, babies out to the guillotine and chopped off their heads. Well, he knew that he was probably going to get chopped. So he, knew, he told his lab assistant, a commoner, a man, uh, that uh, he wanted to do one last experiment. He wanted to know how long the head lives after it's severed from the body. So he got his lab assistant to agree that when he got his head chopped off, he'd run up to the basket, grab his head out, and look at him. And as long as he was still conscious, he would blink deliberately at his lab assistant. He blinked like 19 times. I think he should be the king of all science because he did an experiment once his head was off his body. Can you imagine? But he did. And okay, that's the first shocking thing. The second shocking thing is 
his head was alive off of his body that long. I would prefer for your head to be off your body and you're on to the afterlife, hopefully somewhere great, you know, doing great afterlife things. Not aware that your head is in a basket and it has just been got chopped off your body in the French Revolution. Stop it. Well, my question is, my question is, um, was it just nerves or was it? No, it was like other people don't do this. Other heads don't do this. He did it while he knew what was going on. Did it hurt? We don't know. He couldn't talk. He could just blink. <laughs> it's horrible to think about. So, anyway, there's the guillotine for Mr. Lavoisier. Okay. Whenever you like chop the head off of like an animal or something, like. Alligator. Then they might know it for yeah. a second. Yeah, like I was trying to grab it and it would pull, like his leg would pull away from me. Mm -hmm. like, yes, yes, me. yes. I've seen that too. Like I've I, seen. I grabbed its tail one time. It didn't have a head on it. I mm -hmm. grabbed its tail and mm -hmm. I was dragging it and it turned around and swooped, like, swooped around on me. Trying to get you. Chickens will run around with their head cut off. They'll still run around. I've seen videos of it. Snakes. So it has to be like muscle memory. That can't be like snakes. Do still well, snakes, snakes. Dead. I think it's reptiles too. Reptiles too. Mm -hmm. Frogs. Frogs will jump when you put them in the pan. You can take like, their heart like out and it'll keep eating. Okay, we're off topic. Interesting as it is, off topic. Okay, so what is STP? It's a band, the Stone Temple Pilots. It is an oil treatment, STP, but that's not what it is in chemistry class. STP is the conditions that you do gas experiments under. And it's zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. So uh, usually your problems will say at STP, da 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 da. Because at STP is when the math works out the best. So if you were doing gas experiments at Georgia Tech, you would do it at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. We're not gonna do that. We're not that precise. We're gonna do it at 20 degrees Celsius room temperature and one atmosphere. But, but for the math to be best, and so often it'll say on the, on the problems at STP, that's what it's talking about. Okay, the kinetic molecular theories of gases. This is the, 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 the law, the scientific law or theory that causes gases to behave the way they do. Now, so first of all, gases consist of tiny particles. They are very tiny. These particles are so small, the volume of each particle can be considered zero. Is it really zero? No. But, but when you figure out the volume of a gas, you don't have to subtract the amount that the actual atoms are taken up in that area. We, we consider their volume zero. It's just how the math works, okay? The particles are in constant random motion. They're moving. Colliding with the container and each other causing pressure. The particles are assumed to not attract or repel each other. So this is all just saying, these are things we don't consider when we do the math, and the math will work out. We consider them to have no volume, we consider them to be moving, we consider them to be tiny, and we consider them not to attract or repel each other. In reality, if they run into each other, they are going to attract or repel, but it's so little it doesn't affect the math. Okay. The next one is the average kinetic energy of a gas particle is directly proportional to the Kelvin. Uh, temperature. Now, there is a mathematical symbol for directly proportional. Does anybody know what it is? Um, I didn't know it when I was your age either. I didn't learn it in high school chemistry. I got to college and I remember one day I was studying for it. It was a calculus test. It was in my math book. It was a calculus test, and my calculus teacher hated me. I couldn't figure out why. I thought everybody liked me. I couldn't believe why my calculus teacher, I have everybody in the room, she had picked me to hate. But, oh, she hated me. I was, I'd ask her a question, she'd just look at me, like, a, for a second, evilly, and then turn and keep doing what she was doing. She wouldn't answer my questions. I was like, this is so weird. So I'm studying calculus. I don't understand it. And then this symbol was in the book. And I'm like, great. There's math symbols. I don't even know what they are. I hate this class. So the symbol is this. It's like you start with an equal sign, 
but then you go around to a circle and then you do the other part of the equal sign. It looks like that. I can scroll up for y'all to see it better. Turns out, finally I found out like at the end of the year, I even signed up for her second class for Calculus 2 with her. And, and if I had known, I definitely wouldn't have uh, signed up for Calculus 2 with her. But um, her husband had had an affair with his graduate assistant and she looked more like me than my sister. So I had, it had nothing to do with me. I saw her and thought, oh yeah, we do look alike. So uh, that was the problem with the calculus teacher. <laughs> oh, she hated me. She probably didn't even realize she was doing it. It was probably subconscious, surely in her heart. She would not penalize me because of my looks, but she did. <laughs> okay, so that means that that's the symbol that means directly proportional. You probably just reminded her of her every time she looked at you. Exactly, and was just getting madder by the minute at her husband. I think they stayed married. He was a professor there too. They were both professors in the math department. Did you have his class too? <laughs> no, I never had him. I should have had him. He probably wouldn't have hated me. So, he probably would have thought you looked like the girl. And maybe he would have been nice to me. <laughs> oh, he had his he had his side, honey. He didn't need another one. <laughs> so, all right. Bernoulli's principle. So there's a guy, Italian, and uh, he thought of this principle. It's great. Okay, but anyway, there's a little lesson for y'all in that. What should I have done? When the teacher wouldn't answer my questions, but she answered everybody else's question in the Don't class. Have an with her no, no, yeah, that <laughs> I didn't have the affair with her husband. I'm just kidding. What should I have done as a student? Went up to her and asked her after the class. I did. I, I did try talking to her, and she would barely talk to me and just walk off. I should have gone over her head. I should have gone to the department head or to the dean. I was way too obedient, and. Um, does that make sense? You have got to be your advocate. I should have been my advocate. She didn't have the right not to answer my questions. You know, if she says any questions and I ask one and it's a legitimate question, she didn't have the right not to answer my questions. Yeah, you are paying her. For I'm paying. I, my parents were paying a lot for that college, and I was on scholarship, but somebody was paying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a really good academic scholarship, but um, but my parents had to pay some, and I mean, you know, academic scholarship, your brain's technically paying. Exactly, my brain was paying for it. So uh, so anyway, y'all need to learn that lesson. Is don't just you know, d don't be too subservient. Be your own best advocate. Don't be afraid to go over a teacher's head if you have to. And I know that that's like shocking for me to say as a teacher, but it's true. Don't let people take from you um, without standing up from you for yourself. She was taking from me my right to ask a question in that calculus class, and she didn't have the right to do that. I, it, it, and if she had been honest and said, I just can't teach her, she looks too much like that other girl, they could have transferred me to another class, and everybody would have been happier, right? So I, it was, I should have taking matters in my ha own hands and, and not just done. What was your GPA when you graduated high school? Oh, I, I tied for 10th, so I graduated 10th in my class. Um, I had this horrible concussion my ninth grade year and didn't make A's. I was in a horse accident. I saw double. Now what they do now is they sing you home for a year, but this was the dark ages of the 80s, and they just sent me home to school in my honors. They send you home a year now. You do home, if you have a concussion like I did, that's one of the things I was doing before I taught here is I tutored kids who had gotten sent home for a year for concussions and then I would, their parents would hire me to tutor them to get them ready to return to school because they had had a whole year where they're not allowed to think. Is a concussion that bad? Yeah, it's really bad. And so they do that now. But back then, so in ninth grade, I had always been one of the smartest kids. And then it was ninth grade, and here I am sitting in my honors algebra class. And I remember looking around going, how do they all understand this and I don't? Because I was used to understanding. So what did you graduate with? It was real high. But, it, but, but I didn't make straight A's my ninth grade years. Starting in 10th grade, I went back to straight A's in honors classes. So I made straight A's in 10th, 11th, and 12th in honors and AP, but ninth grade, I didn't make straight A's. So there was like a four. 
Yeah, it was probably over a 4 with all the honors classes. But, but uh, so I got academic scholarship. But anyway, so, I, but the great thing about that concussion was I had to teach myself all these ways to learn and remember with a concussion. And now I use those methods with students and I can help students. And so it all ended up, ended up good. But I made up all these songs, dances, hand claps to get through algebra and geometry, honors algebra and geometry especially. And I still use those teaching kids and it helps. If it could help me concussed, mm -hmm. it helps people who are non-concussed. you a great teacher because you can relate to people who sometimes can't remember things. Right. Uh -huh. I cannot. Uh -huh. I mean, I would hear it and it would not stick. That yeah. concussion was something. But yeah, when I saw double, things would be about this far apart. So I would look and there would be two glasses on the table. It's not like one looks real and one looks ghosty. They both look completely real. I'm concussed and I can't remember which one's the real one and the fake one. So at first I had to ask my mom or other people to do everything for me because I couldn't see. Like I'd be reaching for the wrong one. So I'd ask my mom like to pour stuff for me. Well, I, you get tired of that after months of seeing double. And so I would decide I'm just going to guess and I'd pick one and start pouring. It'd be the wrong one. The glass would be here and I'd just be pouring milk on the table over here. And my mom would yell at me, stop it. You have to ask for help. And I'm like, oh, it's frustrating. I want to do it myself. <laughs> so... Yeah, I had a horse growing up, and I was riding my friend's horse and got a bad concussion. That's a different story. All right, Bernoulli's principle. When fluids, and in physics, fluids are considered gases and liquids because they both flow. Does that make sense to you? When fluids, gases, or liquids move fast, they make a low pressure. And it's how planes fly. You ever wondered how a big old heavy airplane can fly? is this, and I'll explain it to you. Imagine that this, the, the shape of an airplane wing is shaped like this. Imagine there's gas molecules at the beginning of the plane wing. As the gas goes over the plane wing, the molecules that take the route of going over the top of the root wing have further to go than the molecules that go the shortcut on the bottom of the wing. Does that make sense to you? So therefore, they spread out as they go over, making it less dense on top, more dense on bottom, and that creates a push, pushing up on the wing. Bernoulli's principle. Yes? I, we went in like, I, um, we had like flight science last, I had flight science when was Did you go to Lockheed for it? Was it that program? No, it was in the, it was Mm. Last year when mm -hmm. I did that one semester. Right. We went to like really deep depth about all that stuff. Yes, because you have to if you're really going into it. But that gives you an idea. All right, wait. Y'all need to sit still, and we're going to do a few demos. Uh, like, share, subscribe.